namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa okay so Exploring Dhammapada, this is the fourth time and uh, as I have mentioned, I'm using the um, Dhammapada which, is trans which was translated by uh, Buddha, Rakita, Buddha Rakita. So if you want a copy of that, you can actually download from the from online is actually free, online free copy. There are actually many, many vers version of, of uh, Dhammapada throughout the history, many, many versions of Dhammapada have been translated. Uh, but I find this, this is sort of, I like it myself, so I use this one. So as you remember, Dhammapada, uh, uh, a compilation of the verses which was spoken which were spoken during the Buddha's time um, in the daily life so it was it wasn't a, it, they weren't really formal teachings of the Buddha it was just sort of like casual or spontaneous conversation or spontaneous teachings that the Buddha gave in different situations um, when he encountered people or life situations or whatever and, or, or, or because of the bhikkhus um, um, behavior whatever so those are being compiled later on and being passed down uh, throughout the history and I think the most commonly used uh, one of the most commonly used uh, suttas, um, or commonly studied, is this Dhammapada, especially in the in the Theravadan tradition uh, in Burma, Thailand, Sri Lanka. A lot of people actually uh, memorize the Dhammapada. Uh, it's only 423 verses, but it's very very commonly used. So I like I myself like Dhammapada a lot, and um, I I flip over, I use it all the time, and uh, yeah, as my own reference, as my own teachings throughout the days. Sometimes I'm sort of in couldn't find any solution, you know, and uh, or um, troubled. And then uh, take out the Dhammapada and just flip it open and read it. And sometimes I go on to read the stories. Uh, so, so you know, uh, try to try to see if you can actually make use of Dhammapada. And uh, for those, I think all the Chinese, all the Chinese probably have the Chinese version. And uh, uh, if you don't have it, just let me know, and we'll have all the. Um, little booklet, little book of Ch Chinese version. Okay, so these are the themes that we, um, we explore about Dhammapada. And we have done three so far. The first one is human life is rare and precious. Second is self-discipline. The th last one we did was cause and effect, that means karma. And this, this week we'll do happiness. And then there were th there are three more to come: good friends, self reliance, and following the Dhamma. So those are the themes that we will explore with Dhammapada. So let us go back to um, last time or last month about the reflections on cause and effect, the law of causation. That means karma. Or karma is another word to represent law of causation. So we, we talked about uh, um, causes and effect last time. 
quite a bit. And uh, it seems that throughout the last talk, I actually focus on a lot on evil actions or, unev or unwholesome actions. But remember, everything is sort of like duality. So when, when you are not performing unwholesome actions, you're very likely to perform neutral actions or wholesome actions. So, so if, if you have, uh, 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 of course, when you perform unwholesome actions, you are planting those unwholesome seeds and the results will be unwholesome consequences. Similarly, if with the willed uh, wholesome action, then wholesome consequences will result that's, that's the law, that's the nature, right? So let us go to reflections and spend a few minutes on reflections and we, we can actually go a um, uh, a a short discussion. So which one worry worries you most? The cause or the effect? <laughs> the cause or the effect and why? And uh, give me an example to, in your life experiences about cause and effect. Or, and then have you learned anything from that experience? Anything, any of these um, fi four reflections, you can touch on them uh, if you have something to share. Yeah, we would love to hear it. Anybody? Irene, yeah? Hello, how are you? I'm everyone. Hello. So, I would like to share, I believe the, uh, which one worries me the most is the cost. Mm. And a why? Because when the timing when the conditions are right and the timing is there, then the cost, the effects will show. Either it's a good one or bad one. So it depends on the, uh, the impact, you know, like um, the action that you perform is wholesome or unwholesome. If unwholesome, then you will see, like, people said, um, there's a, a flower. Flower effect, or you know, a heavy one too. You know, mm. so it's very dainty. But what I want, what I want to share is, um, I thought about that. You know, let me think about this topic. And and there's many names of um, causes and effects that things have been happening in my life too. But I, I chose one. It just happened recently. Mm. That is, and I, I still feel very happy. And it just happened that you know, like. Today's topic is happiness, but uh, it's my, my trip to Poland to stay there for 10 days. And I, I don't know what happened there, you know why, and, but when I came back, I'm still so happy. <laughs> <laughs> You're still happy? You're still happy? Oh, that's good, that long lasting. <laughs> yeah, but you guys need to make a trip to there and then, you know, really bow to the Buddha. And in, Incredible, the energy there is incredible, you know. So um, it, it really helped me to shift and more focus inward when there is something um, happening, you know, either a conversation or like an um, a, a, a argument or not, you know, we'll just stop and reflect inward afterwards and see why I react to such situation just like a short uh, reaction to my kids um, attitude or something mm. but anyway you know like it, it just really helped um, after this trip I don't know why so so feel so happy so that's the cause that I made it to a poem for 10 days <laughs> and the effect <laughs> is long lasting happiness <laughs> <laughs> congratulations good for you <laughs> that's well Next one. Next, next one, you never know. <laughs> Don't expect it to be the same, okay? <laughs> Even happier. <laughs> Great. Thank you. 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 Th
Great. Good. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> That's quite nice to spend 10 days and then you're happy forever. <laughs> Nora. Nora? Yes, Nora. Long time no see, Nora. Um, so what worries me the most is the effect. So, um, you know, if I do something bad that I know I'm going to have a, a, a bad result. Yeah. So Consequence, yeah. The consequences of my actions worry me. And, and uh, a funny example, of, I can think of when I was 16 and I just gotten my driver's license and I, um, well, um, I, um, before that, that, that day, that morning, I'd gone shopping and I'd stolen a top that was worth $10. Oh. And I mean, it wasn't something like I was into stealing. Their, it was just my group of friends. We just went through this phase. I don't know why. <laughs> Anyhow, so I stole this, this top for $10 and then I went to visit my sister and I parked on, she lives kind of, her apartment's on a main street. And I got a parking ticket for $10. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, I love that. I love that. I love that sharing. That's instant karma, Nora. <laughs> wow. Good for you, though. Good for you. I mean, that was a, that was a very kind reminder from the universe to you. Yeah. Don't don't you ever steal again? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. You weren't you weren't being caught, and yet you also get reminded from this universe that don't you ever steal again. You'll get a bigger ticket next time. <laughs> oh, I like that, Nora. Thank you. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Nora. Okay. Anybody else? Have you, <coughs> have you spent some time on reflecting on these questions? Hi, Catherine. Hi, people. Long Hello. Time no see. Long time no see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what worries me more is, of course, the effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a simple example is I was diagnosed in May with appendicitis. Okay. Yeah. But then uh, it's not acute, so doctor says I have to do anything. But then you know now um, everywhere is open up, and then I went out to meet with friends, and that day it was so hot, and I had an iced lemon tea. It's not only one, but I had two. Uh huh. So Kicking so up. I, what I learned is whenever I go out, even if I go out with friends, I have to be mindful of what I'm eating. And even though if they're having iced lemon tea or some, something, you know, really tasty but not, not good for my health, so I just bring my own food. <laughs> that's, that's good too. <laughs> but I don't know whether you're. Your lemon tea has anything to do with your uh, pancreati pancreatitis? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't. I, I doubt that. But, uh, but, but, uh, but that's a good. But that's a good mindfulness. You know, uh, less craving. <laughs> good, good. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Really? <laughs> that's, a, that's a big topic, cause and effect. <laughs> okay, so 
<laughs> just before uh, <laughs> in this, uh, this afternoon, I, uh, we got a message from Eva. <laughs> And she said, I made a very stupid mistake today. <laughs> that was a, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I think I need to share this. It's, it's so, it's so, I think it's so hilarious. But it's so, it's, it's so true, a cause and effect. Uh, she, went, she went to the back of the property <laughs> they, where they were doing the landscaping and uh, she was, all sucked into the mud. <laughs> so she had to go home and change and wash herself and then came back. And so I said, don't you, please, 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 you guys, please don't go there. They are doing site work and that's, that is a filtration, that is a filtration field and filtration field is very soft and soggy and the landscaper <laughs> is working on it <laughs> they're trying to to make that a, a walking area so it's not a walking area yet you see that's a instant effect the cause is because you are you just wanted to go into the mud or just curious curious to see what's happening down there so that curiosity lead you to be sucked in to the mud, by the mud. <laughs> and the really stupid part is that it took me like four steps to realize I should turn back. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't turn back. So you I didn't turn back and you walk on? No, no, it took me like four steps. Before you realized that oh, you should turn oh, back? Oh, no. oh, that's a little bit too late. <laughs> That was, that was a little bit too slow. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's also instant result uh, that taught you a lesson, you know. Don't go into the construction site. <laughs> Even though you have approval to go into the buildings, that doesn't mean that you can go everywhere. <laughs> okay? So, yeah, just be very mindful. Good thing that you don't you didn't fall. Otherwise, you'll be all muddy and bum your head because so so many big boulders there. Yeah, be careful. Yeah, not going there anymore. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Effect, cause and effect. Hmm. I'm surprised that you you will actually worry more about the effects than the cause. Um, which we really should change our mentality, really should worry more about the cause than the effect. Because um, with the cause, there will come an effect. And that's already too late. <laughs> when the effect appears, it's already too late. You cannot change it anymore. Of course, you can change how your attitude to deal with that effect. Um, and then, and then you hope, hopefully you, you will uh, change and correct yourself for the future. But it's really wiser. It's really wiser to really start worrying I'm not really just worry, just paying more attention to the cause rather than the effect. Um, that's why in the Chinese, in the Mahayana traditions, <coughs> there is a saying is that all sentient beings are just af afraid of cause of effects, worry about effects. But bodhisattvas, bodhisattvas are very aware of causes. So they make sure that they don't plant unwholesome causes. So when you don't plant unwholesome causes, definitely you will not reap unwholesome consequences, right? And if you plant wholesome causes, 
you don't need to wish for wholesome consequences. Wholesome consequences will naturally arise, will naturally come. Okay, so last one, Mali. Hi, good evening, yes. Uh, um, so which one worries me worries us the most is uh, you said cause because there is no effect if there's no cause. Yes. Um, give an example. Um, so if, if there's um, no I was thinking more of a positive um, positive action that brings positive results. Of course. Yeah. So uh, sometimes what we do, um, we uh, especially during COVID times, um, we used to order food for somebody who is alone, or you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, um, elderly. Didn't have yeah neighbors to you know, take care. We would do that, and uh, I think the receiver feels cared for, mm. and we feel. Yeah. For doing something like that. Yeah. So, so what we learn from it is that you know it's not just uh, it's not just the giver who is getting the receiver who is going to be happy. It's us too. It's yeah, of us course. Too. Yeah, it's of course. So, it's always uh, mutual. Yeah, that's that's a positive effect. But when we talk about cause and effect, we always assume it's negative for some reason. I I, I don't know. I I was looking at it that way earlier. Ah. Thought, well, it can be uh, something wholesome. Of course. When people think of karma, it seems that people already sort of stigmatize the word uh, as an unwholesome. But, but no, karma is just actions. Actions, cause and effects, actions that you have, you have done. So it could be positive, it could be uh, wholesome, or it could be neutral. I'll keep you unwholesome. So, you know, I'm glad that you're sharing um, positive, positive um, or wholesome, wholesome karma. Good. So one other thing uh, I can add to it is that, um, so when we do this kind of sharing, um, you know, some uh, practicing generosity, we discuss it with our kids. Mm. So now they started doing the same. Good. Yeah. 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 Because they didn't they didn't understand that at the beginning. I mean giving is giving, right? Now that yeah. we talk about it, yeah. They sort of you know, they feel that okay, this is something more than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Deeper and more more than that. Yeah. Great. Very good. Great. Okay. So oh, I forgot to do something today. Never mind. Okay. All right. So today we talk about happiness. What brings happiness? What brings happiness? In the mundane world, most people think that happiness comes from being rich, famous, being successful, being powerful. You know, and um, in the in the uh, commercial world, then you make lots of money. You you make products, or in the academic world, you get PhD, you get master, you get many PhD, you get many master degree, and you you write many articles, and you're a very famous scholar, and all those. And then then people think that that is success. That will bring happiness. But really. In the in the in the Buddha's teachings, no, he 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 didn't think so. So, the in 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 the Buddha's teachings, he said happiness is not something that comes from this material satisfaction. So, so what really brings happiness? So we look at verse thirty-five. It says, wonderful indeed, it is to subdue the mind, so difficult to subdue, ever swift, and wandering wherever it desires, a tamed mind brings happiness. So a 
you, you, can, you can see what brings happiness. A tamed mind brings happiness. An untamed mind brings unhappiness. It's, it's, you know, so logical. So we can see uh, to subdue the mind, and it says very difficult to subdue the mind. You and me, you and I know, it's very difficult to subdue our monkey mind. The mind keeps jumping from one branch to another branch, never stop jumping, never. And uh, one, you know, maybe for a split second, you seem, you, that monkey mind seems to have settled, and you say, oh, nice, it's settled. Then next minute, next second, right there, it starts jumping. So it's very difficult to subdue this monkey mind, this mind, because it is so swift and it wander wherever it desires. So when we do not have the control over the mind, it controls us. It wants to go there, then you follow it. It wants, it wants to go here, it, you follow it. If we don't practice to train and tame this mind, so that's why I always say meditation is training and taming this wild mind, this monkey mind. So this is, this is talking about um, happiness. And when a mind is being tamed, it doesn't need to go to specially look for happiness. When a mind is tamed, there is this inner happiness that's, that's naturally is there. You don't have to look, go and look for happiness. You don't have to go and do something to be happy, to make yourself happy, or to eat something to make yourself happy. You don't have to. It's in there. It's in there. So, In, the, in, the, in, in verse 35 and the coming, coming verses, it, it talks about where and how we can be happy. So we all know when we try to subdue the mind, it's so difficult. But through training, through perseverance, through patience, it's possible. So we all have experienced that ourselves through years of years of practice. In the beginning of the practice, we might not be able to sit even for 10 minutes quietly, steadily. But then throughout the years, we put in the efforts, having the patience, perseverance, and determination. Gradually, we are able to sit 20 minutes and 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50, and then an hour. Even though throughout the hour, this mind will still jump here and there, but still you are able to maintain a stable body and yet an observant mind to observe that jumpy mind. So part of the mind is being subdued, but not all of the mind. When, when all of the mind is subdued, we become, we, we enter the stream, we go into we go into the four fruits and we become Buddha Sava or even Buddha already, right? So it's still a long way, but it's possible that we are able to subdue the mind. Okay, so the, then the next verse we talk about happiness is, it says, let the discerning person guard his mind. So difficult to detect and extremely subtle wandering wherever it desires. A guarded mind brings happiness. Similarly, as the last verse, it talks about a guarded mind. And an unguarded mind is very difficult to detect. So difficult to detect and extremely subtle. So we can think, we can actually reflect upon ourselves is Sometimes we do things, sometimes we say things, sometimes we think about things. And where 
why and how? Why did I think like this? How did I get, how, how do I get to think like this? And why do I think like this? But most of us actually don't sit down and reflect upon that seriously. Most of us just, just shuffle off, oh, I've said something nasty today. That's okay, it's gone. Then, but, but if we start to reflect upon that action that we've done today, either to people or either to ourselves, or, or, or just, just did something, and we think that is not correct. That makes me unhappy. That makes me, you know, thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm unwise. And then when you, do you actually start, start reflecting upon it yourself? Why did I do this? How come I do it like this? What happens? If people, if we start to reflect upon it a little bit more, we will start to, we will, we'll be able to see those thoughts are very subtle. Some, some of the thoughts are very subtle. Very, very fleeting. Fleeting. And sometimes you don't catch them. But if you develop a habit of reflection, you will be able to catch them sooner. Okay? So with this verse, there is a story behind it. And it's talking about a disgruntled bhikkhu. A <laughs> very <laughs> disgruntled uh, uh, bhikkhu. So the Buddha uh, uh, said this verse to um, a young a young bhikkhu who was the son of a, a very well-off banker. And uh, this young man, one one time, he asked a bhikkhu who used to go to his house for, for offerings, for alms. And this young man asked the bhikkhu, so what should I do to be liberated from the unhappiness of life? And the bhikkhu said to him, well, you should divide your property into three parts. The first part is you go and make use of the money to do business with. And then the second part is you use that part, one third of the money to sustain the family. And then the third, the last third is you give to charity. So the young man heard what the bhikkhu told him. So he, he followed his instructions, he did it. And he did it and then he came, he came back to the bhikkhu and said, so what should I do next? so that I could get rid of the, the, the unhappiness, the ills of life. So the bhikkhu told this young man, he said, well, first you should go and take refuge in the Triple Gems. Having faith in the, in the Buddha, in the Dhamma, and in the Sangha. And then you start to observe the five precepts. Not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to commit adultery, and not to take intoxicants. And then after that, you could advise to take, to take 10 precepts. Ah, that means not to wear perfume, not to intentionally go, go to listen to uh, 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 concerts, music, and not to decorate yourself, not to sleep on high beds, and not to touch money in those old days, and not to sleep on high beds and sit on high chairs. So those are 10 precepts. And then 30, th lastly, he said, you can renounce the mundane life and enter the monastic life in order to, to be free from this unhappiness, the ills of life. So this young man heard what the bhikkhu said and he followed and he became a bhikkhu. He became a monk. As a bhikkhu, he was given teachings in very difficult uh, uh, teachings in the Abhidhamma 
and also in the Vinaya, that means the precepts. And as you all know that the Vinaya for Bhikkhu is 250 and for Bhikkhuni is 348. That is really not easy. So then Abhidhamma is actually also very difficult too. And he thought, oh, so difficult, this Abhidhamma. And these precepts, Vinaya, is so strict and <laughs> I, and, and I can't even stretch my arms out like that. You know, we we're not supposed to like yawn and like, like this. You, sometimes you, like I see Goldie, our dog, you know, after a good sleep, then she was just stretched like this. And we were not supposed to do this because it's, you know, it doesn't look nice, right? It doesn't look, look proper. And he said, ah, it's, it's too much. It's no freedom at all. They think that is no freedom. So, and so the, this bhikkhu said, well, I think I better, I better disrupt and become a householder again. So as a result of doubt and discontent, he became unhappy, very unhappy. And he kept on neglecting his duties as a bhikkhu. And he also became very thin and emaciated, so, so skinny. And because he, he's, not, he's not happy, right? So when the Buddha came to know about this bhikkhu, um, then he said to this young bhikkhu, he said, let, the, let yourself guard your own mind because this mind is very difficult to detect. If you can only control your mind, you will have nothing more to control. So guard your own mind. If you want to be happy, you have to guard your mind because it's the mind that makes you happy or it's the mind that makes you unhappy. Okay, it's nobody else. And then when in the Dhammapada, it also talk about how association with people, with the right people can bring you happiness. So I, I use the word happy association. So in verse 206, actually 206, 207 and 208, actually the Buddha uh, set these three verses together in the same situation under the same circumstances, 200, yeah, 206, 207, and 208. But we are going just to look at 206 and 207. So uh, 206, he said, good it is to see the noble ones. To live with them is ever blissful. One will always be happy by not encountering fools. So, so it tells you how can you become happy is stop encountering fools, then you will become happy. You will, ha you will have happiness. But we are very foolish ourselves. We are very foolish ourselves. We always go to have a great relationship with fools rather than with the wise ones. Why? Because we are foolish. That's all. <laughs> we are ignorant. And we are, we are scared. And sometimes we are scared, sometimes we are afraid, or sometimes we don't have confidence in ourselves. So, and, and most of all, we are actually ignorant. That's why we, 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 we relate to the foolish to the fool rather than to the wise. So uh, here the story behind verse 206 is talking about the king Saka. Uh, you know Saka is the king of heaven. And uh, at, the, at one time the Buddha, the Buddha was very ill and uh, king, the king Saka came to look after the Buddha and Buddha told him, you don't have to look after me. I have many bhikkhus who will look after me. 
Vasaka insisted on looking after the, the, the Buddha for 10 months. When the Buddha, well, later on, the Buddha actually passed into a Paranibbana. So he came, he, came, he looked after, and then, and then the, the bhikkhu was very, were very surprised to see the King Saka came to look after the Buddha. And so they asked the Buddha, why would King Saka attend to your ailments for so long? And, uh, and, uh, and, and the Buddha told the bhikkhus, there is, no, is, there is no surprising about the Saka looking after me. Um, because once, the, when, in the old days, when the, the former Saka was growing very, very old, and he was about to pass away, and he came to see me. Then I taught him the Dhamma. The Buddha said, I taught him the Dhamma. While listening to the Dhamma, he attained the first fruit, the Sotapanna. And then he passed away and re reborn as the king of Saka, the king of heaven. All this happened to him simply because he listened to the Dhamma. He, associate with, he associated with the wise. So the Buddha said, so because it is good to see the noble ones, especially the Buddha, right, Arya, noble person. And it is a pleasure to live with them. And to live with fools is indeed painful. I think we could, we <laughs> I think we could relate to that. Um, we always think that others are foolish. <laughs> when, we, when we live in the communities, you know, especially when, when people come into a monastic community um, uh, as, as fresh bees, fresh bees, and um, like freshmen into college, always being um, make fun of, or sometimes the, f the fresh ones are still so, so in, in, the, in the head, so mundane. So they bring in all these mundane thoughts, mundane behavior. And the obese think that, oh, they are so fresh. They don't know anything. So, you know, there's constantly, constantly conflicts, constant conflicts. And he, this one thinks that one is foolish and that one thinks this one is even more foolish. So it's constantly, constantly thinking the other side is foolish than themselves. So actually that is quite foolish to think that <laughs> about others being foolish. Okay, <laughs> that is the most, I think that's the most foolish. So, to live, and then when we think that to live with fools is painful, think about, think about that. Is that fool, is really, really others foolish? Is really that outside person foolish? Or you thinking that people is foolish? That fool is yourself. Think about that. You, you yourself is the fool. So when you, th when you are foolish, you will not be happy. So encountering, uh, always be happy by not encountering fools. First fool that you encounter is yourself. For me, to how, how I read this verse, how I actually interpret this verse is not the outside fools, it's the inside fool. So just be wise and not to, not to relate to your, f to your inside food all the time, okay? So that's what the Buddha said, one will always be happy. And then 207, he said, indeed, one who moves in the company of fools grieves for a long time. Of course you will be. Whether the outside fools or the inside fools, you will be, you'll be grieving for a long, long time. You'll be very unhappy. And association with fools is ever painful, like partnership with an enemy. But happy is association with the wise, like meeting one's own relatives. So you will say, oh, I'm, I'm not in good terms with my relatives. So you are, you are very exceptional. 
okay? But that's not the Buddha meant to be, uh, meant to say. He meant to, he meant to, to say is always have harmony within the family. Remember in the Buddha's words, um, that one chapter is talking about harmony in family and how, how does a wife should treat a, a husband and how should a father or a husband treat the wife and how, how should a father treat a, a son, a daughter, and how should the children uh, treat the, 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 the parents and how should the servant treat the boss and how should the boss look after the servant. So in the Buddha's word, there is a chapter like that. So you can go and refresh your memory in that book, uh, from that book. So happy is association with the wise, like meeting one's own relatives. So not to associate with the foolish, but to associate with the wise and to honor those who are worthy of honor. And this is the greatest blessing that is from the Mangala Sutta. Remember the first four blessings in the Mangala Sutta, Kachanking. It says not to associate with the foolish, but to associate with the wise and to honor those who are worthy of honor. This is the greatest blessing. And with greatest blessing, bring great happiness. It's natural, right? So that, that means we have to make the right choice of who to associate with. Friends, um, colleagues, you, sometimes you, you don't have a choice to choose. Families, you don't have a choice to choose. But friends, you have a choice. So if you, if you find that the friends are not very dynamic and not very moral, you have a choice to walk away, to associate less, okay? And, but if you have friends who are very moral, who are very diligent, who are very um, mindful, very generous, very kind and compassionate, and then you try to make an effort to associate with those friends on a, a more frequent basis for your own benefits, to learn from them. Okay, so verse 30, 376, he said, let him associate with friends who are noble, energetic, and pure in life. Let him be cordial and refined in conduct. Thus, full of joy, he will make an end of suffering. End of suffering, that means you're free of suffering. That means on the other side, you will be happy, right? You, if you don't suffer, that means you're happy. If you're happy, that means you're not suffering. It's so simple. So end of suffering means a full of happiness. There's no place for suffering to exist when you're happy. But when you're suffering, there's no place for happiness to be there. Okay? So he's here, here he says, the Buddha said, let him associate with friends who are noble, energetic, and pure in life. So do not associate with the foolish. Because why? Friends could be very, very influential. And if you have some friends who are negatively influential, then you will have that impact from them. But if you have friends who are very positive and who are very moral, as I said just now, then you will learn a lot from them. So associate with those noble, energetic, and pure people in your life. Then you will be, you will be free of sufferings. So those are the happy association or wholesome association. So, and the next one is way to happiness. So, there are many ways to happiness, many ways to happiness. There is this mundane way, you think, that, oh, I strive forward uh, to, to, to be successful, to be famous, to be powerful, to, you know, to be authoritative, whatever. No, that's not what the Buddha taught. The Buddha taught way to happiness is way more super mundane. 
And he says in here, verse 201, it says, Victory begets amity. The defeated dwell in pain. Happily the peaceful live, discarding both victory and defeat. So this is, this is a story from, uh, about the defeat of the king of Kosala. The Buddha uttered this verse uh, while he was in the uh, Jetta Vana Monastery in Jetta Grove. The king of Kosala was defeated in battle by his own nephew. His sister was married to, to, um, to this, to this um, Aja, Ajata Satu, Ajata Satu. So the king of Kosala was defeated three times by this Ajata Satu. And he was very depressed and he felt very ashamed about this three times defeat. And he lamented, 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 and he's always said to himself, what a disgrace. I cannot even conquer this boy <laughs> who still smells of mother's milk, he says. <laughs> that means very young, right? Immature to him. And it is better that I should die. So King Kosala thought that it was such a disgrace to have been defeated by this um, Ajata Satu for three times because he was so young and uh, so immature that he shouldn't, be, he shouldn't lose his battle uh, uh, to him. So he felt so depressed, felt so much ashamed, and he refused to eat. So he went on a hunger strike. <laughs> and, 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 and he didn't rise every day, he just stayed in his bed and became so distressed. And uh, the, so he, the, words of the, the, the words about the king's situation actually spread to the Buddha's ears. And the Buddha heard them, the Buddha said to the bhikkhus. Actually, he was teaching the bhikkhus. He said, bhikkhus, Similar like this, victory begets amity, the defeated dwell in pain, happily the peaceful live, discarding both victory and defeat. So he said, because in one who conquers, in one who wins the war, amity and hatred will increase because they would want to increase their territory. They may want to, you know, uh, uh, fight another war again. One who is defeated will feel pain and distress, but a wise one would not do so. A wise one would live happily, ignoring or discarding whether it's a defeat or it's a, a victory. And a wise one won't even go to war. A wise person won't even go to war, right? Let alone really um, needing to discard both victory and defeat. So, so here, this way to happiness is don't start a war. <laughs> don't start a war. Don't start a war with yourself. Don't start a war with others. That's one way to happiness. And then and then the next verse we talk about, you can see is 379 jumps all the way almost to the, to the end. Is by oneself, one must censor oneself and scrutinize oneself. The self-guarded and mindful monk will always live in happiness. This is the, towards the end is actually 379 is talking about the monk. The whole, the whole chapter is talking about the monk. So that's why it says, the self-guarded and mindful monk will always live in happiness. But I think similarly, the self-guarded and mindful person will always live in, hap in happiness. 
So we can look at this verse in two parts. The first part is by oneself, one must censor oneself and scrutinize oneself. That means one should not be too lenient with themselves. But yet, don't bash yourself all the time. One must censor oneself. That means one must guard oneself. Guard oneself and check on oneself and reflect upon oneself. That means one has to check on the, also check on the morality, right? Check on whether they are diligent. Check on themselves whether they are wasteful. Check on oneself whether they are selfish. And I talk about morality, right? And check on oneself on also of qualities, right? Generosity, uh, sila, samadhi, panya, metta, karuna, compassion, loving kindness, compassion. So you, one has to guard oneself in all these aspects. But in order, in order to actually censor oneself and scrutinize oneself, there is one very important quality, quality that one needs to have. What is that? I'm asking, what is that quality? I'm asking, Nora. I'm going to guess because you said don't be too hard on yourself, so to have some self-compassion at the same time. Okay. Yeah, all right, good. But how, how can you, how can you know that you are, you're, you're not bashing yourself? How can you know that? How can you have some compassion for yourself? How can you know? By being honest. Honest? Honest. Ever said honest. How can you know that you are honest or not? Huh? Self-awareness. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. KS, were you going to say mindfulness? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see you. I didn't see you put up your hand. I only saw you. Yeah? I was a bit slow in carrying on the mic. Oh, you should raise your hand first. <laughs> yeah. Mindfulness. Yes, mindfulness. Self-guarded mindfulness. What you said was right. Honesty, self-compassion, they are all correct. But you have to have that mindfulness in order to know whether you're honest, right? In order to know that you, you, you have to love yourself. Well, are you loving yourself or you're bashing yourself? You have to know. And that knowing is being mindful, right? So mindfulness is actually very, very important. Very, 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 you have to develop very strong mindfulness. Otherwise, you wouldn't know about yourself. You wouldn't know whether you are stingy. You wouldn't know whether you are arrogant. You wouldn't know whether you are wasteful. You wouldn't know whether you're generous. You wouldn't know whether you are loving kindness. You wouldn't know whether you are, you're honest. You wouldn't know. Only if, even if you know, it will be very superficial if you don't have very strong mindfulness. Okay, so when, when that, that, that part, one has to censor oneself and scrutinize oneself with very strong mindfulness. Okay, and the self-guarded and mindful monk will always live in happiness. That's the result of being mindful, developing that strong mindfulness. So there's two parts. One is the cause, the other part is the result in this verse. 
All right? OK. So let us go further exploring about happiness. So in Dhammapada, which verse tell us how far does happiness go? How, the, how, how far does happiness go? And uh, happiness go quite far, very far, very, very far. Okay, so verse 168, we look at verse 168. Arise, do not be heedless. Lead the life of good conduct. Righteous live happily both in this world and the next. So you can see happiness travels very fast, go very fast. It takes you very far. It, it takes you, not, it, not only this life makes you happy, but into the future. This world, that means this life. Next, the next, the next world, that means next life. Or the next lives, many, many lives. So happiness travels very far. It goes very far. It doesn't just stay here. Look at Ari. She spent 10 days in Polam and she's back for, for a month already <laughs> in the Bay Area. She's still happy. Okay, so that's, that's, it goes far. And 169, it says, Lead the life of good conduct. Do not lead a base life. That means a low life. The righteous live happily, both in this world and the next. Okay? So this life and the next life. Hundred and sixty-nine, hundred and sixty-eight. So it's talking about the world, that the chapter on the world. So here the, the difference between this one and the last one is lead a life of good conduct. Here is that lead a life of good conduct. Do not lead a base life. And then the same is the righteous live happily both in this world and the next. So why would the Buddha say these words or said these words? Um, he's talking about his father, his father, the king, Sudodana. And so, so uh, the Buddha one, one time uh, was was uh, staying in the Negro Dharma monastery and he gave his teachings to his relatives, his families. And the king, being the father of the Buddha, thinking that, well, the, the, my son was very close to my home and he will have to go out for alms tomorrow. So I'm sure that he will come to my house for alms, for offerings. But he did not invite the Buddha to come for alms. He thought that the Buddha would come. So next morning he prepared a lot of food and uh, very good food for, for, to, for, for giving alms to many, many hundreds of thousands of bhikkhus. But the Buddha did not come. And uh, he was waiting, but his daughter-in-law, that means of the, the, Buddha's, the Buddha's wife, the Buddha's wife, Yasodhara, she looked out from the, from the window of the palace and she saw the Buddha was going around for alms, but he wasn't coming to the house. And he finished going for alms already. So she went down, she went down from the, from the, from the top floor to went down to tell to tell his, her father-in-law that the, the Buddha is not coming. So the king was not happy. King Suddhodana was, wasn't happy. So he went, he went to, <laughs> he went to challenge the Buddha. He went, he said, 
you are the family. You are the family. And the family of Katya. In the old days, the Katya was like the one of the high rank in 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 the in the in the caste right, system. And you should not go around to other houses for alms. You should come back to your father's house for alms. Why didn't you come? And this is the disgrace that you go to, to from door to door begging for food. And the Buddha said to him, "This is what all the teach, past Buddhas." did and I'm following the tradition, the good tradition. And this is a good conduct that the, all the Buddhas pass down. And this is the practice of all the past Buddhas. And I am just following examples of the past Buddhas because it is, it is right and it is proper for me to keep up the good tradition. And <laughs> the, the king didn't have any, any word to say because the Buddha was so wise in you know, giving such a wise answer because he is not his son anymore. He is the Buddha. And so he was following the footsteps of all the past Buddhas. And he was upholding a good deed, a good conduct. So the, the Buddha said, you know, we always have to keep up our life, not to go on to the base life. That means a low life, a base life. We need to rise up, rise up and to live a righteous life because righteous life will bring happiness this lifetime and the future lifetime. Okay. So, and then 122, it says, one who while himself seeking happiness does not oppress with violence. Other beings who also desire happiness will find happiness hereafter. Hereafter, that means here in this world and in the future world. So one who, who seeks his own happiness by oppressing others will not be happy in the future lives. They will only be happy right here now. But, because why? Because others also want to be happy and you oppressing them, then how, how are you going to make yourself happy? You're not, plant, you're not planting happy seeds. You're not planting wholesome seeds. How can you reap wholesome, wholesome consequences of happiness? You, you won't and you can't. So, so the actually 132 actually go with 131 also. So they are the similar, verse, the similar verses that the Buddha spoke at the same time. And he said, all uh, 100, one who while himself seeking happiness oppresses with violence other beings who will not attain happiness hereafter. One who while himself seeking happiness does not oppress 131 is somebody oppresses, and 132 is does not oppress. So one is oppressing, one doesn't oppress. So you can see the result is what, what, one who doesn't oppress those people who are seeking happiness, they will be happy themselves. But one who is oppressing peop, those people who are seeking happiness, they will not be happy. So. This is way to happiness. And how far does happiness go? Happiness go far, very far. But who, who and what is in control of happiness? Who control us to be happy or not happy? You, me, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, me, I, yeah, I, me. So I, this, is the, this is my favorite verse, verse one and two, right? It's because we are talking about happiness, so I'll, I'll jump on to verse two. So the first, first one is talking about uh, sufferings. 
So verse 2 talk about happiness. So verse 2, it says, mind precedes all mental states, and mind is their chief. They are all mind wrote. If with a pure mind a person speaks or acts, happiness follows him like his never departing shadow. So we are very familiar with, the, with this verse. Um, I constantly bring it up. And uh, verse one is, mind precedes all mental states, mind is the chief, they are all mind wrote. The, th the, the first three sentences are the same. If with an impure mind a person speaks or acts, suffering follows him, like the wheel that follows the foot of the ox, or the footprints of the ox, you can say. So verse one and verse two talk about how we are controlled by our mind. So happiness, if we want to be happy, we have to guard the mind. We have to censor ourselves. We have to scrutinize ourselves. We have to reflect ourselves. And most of all, with mindfulness, we need to correct ourselves and change ourselves. And with further mindfulness, we can transform ourselves. So that's why when, when, you, when people start to adopt a very rigorous practice in meditation and a very regular uh, practice, they will gradually, gradually open up. They will gradually, gradually brighten up. They will gradually, gradually become happier and less sulky, less angry. If you are still that angry, if you are still that impulsive, if you are still that so reactive, you have to check on yourself. Is your mindfulness working? Are you, are you actually using your mindfulness in your daily life? Are you actually ap applying it in your daily life? If you are not, then you are just like that big tree like that big piece of boulder sitting at the back of the filtration field, sitting there for 100 of years, it's going to sit there for 100 of years because we are not going to move it. We're not able to move it. It's too heavy, right? So no matter how, I, I always say this, no matter how, how many retreats you attend, no matter how long you can sit, if during the day, during your life, when you are in, in, in actions, when you are in relationships, dealing with people, you are a different person. You are, that, you are not calm, you're not mindful, you're impulsive, you're reactive, you're angry, then you better check yourself. You better check yourself. You better scrutinize yourself more. That time you have to bash yourself. Because to wake yourself up, hey, you stop doing that. You are just a meditator on paper. <laughs> Not a meditator in the reality, in practice. So very, 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 I think these two verses, verse one and verse two, are very enlightening verses, very enlightening teachings that we all can, can use it day in, days in and days out. And mind precedes our mental states. Anger, ill will, animosity, these are mental states. The most important is the mind. The mind is the back, ba the, the, the back screen director, behind the screen director, and it directs us all the time. So that is happiness. I don't know whether I, I'd have talked about happiness, but I have talked about happiness. <laughs> and the verses from, from Dhammapada 
talking about happiness, though, it's, though some of them are not really directly talking about happiness, but it tells you the way out of, out, out of misery, and then that means the way to happiness. Okay, uh, Eva wanted me to talk about this um, inmate that we visited last week, and uh, Eva went to visit him uh, this morning uh, without me. I, I, I couldn't go because I had meetings. Last week when I went in there, when we went in there, oh, it has been three, four months since we last saw him, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he is uh, end-stage cancer, uh, but he had been meditating with us for over five years before the COVID. And he never missed one sitting. Every Thursday and every one day course, he would be there. He is a devoted Christian, very devoted. He always like, after the Thursday meditation, then he will stay on for the Bible study class. He has changed over the years after he has actually started meditation. He changed to be so mellow and so appreciative and so much forgiving. So last week we went to see him the first time after a few months and uh, he was in the hospital, the prison hospital. And the officers told us which room was it, right? Mm -hmm. So we went in the room and we, we knocked and we went in and we called his name. And I look at Eva's eyes, Eva's look at I, my eyes, and both of us were asking the same question in our, heart, in our mind. Did we have the right room? Because we couldn't recognize him, hardly recognize him. Did we go to the wrong room? And so, then I call, and I call out his name. And he turned around, I said, and he said, yeah. So we know that he, it was him. So uh, we, we sat down and uh, I knew that he couldn't recognize us. And, but he kept talking about, you know, getting paper and writing down a letter and uh, asking to see his doctor and, uh, and talking about the nurse coming in and, ask, and t telling the nurse that he has this tooth pain, this ache is so, so bad. And he said, I would pay to have this fixed. And the, and, and, and the nurse said, oh, you don't, you don't need to have it fixed. And, and, and he said, no, I, I want it fixed because I don't want to live with this pain. And, and the nurse said, oh, you're still alive, right? Something like that, right? And uh, he said, yeah, I'm still alive. That's why I wanted to have it fixed. But they, been, they didn't pay much attention. Of course, that might not be a, just a tooth pain. A, a toothache, it could be from the cancer, you know, you never know. But he was trying to fight to go out to, uh, to the general public uh, palliative care. But the, the, the institution wouldn't allow him because once he would, once he's released into the uh, outside public hospital, then he will be in, in palliative care, he would be like, like free, a free man. So his, his sentence is naturally gone. They wouldn't release him into palliative yet, up to last week. So last week we were, we were there, we were sort of trying to find ways to, 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 to you know, relay with him. Eventually I said, do you want me to pray with you? He said, yes. I said, do you want me to read you the Bible? He said, yes. So I said, where is your Bible? So we, 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 I, looked, I looked when I asked him. I couldn't see the Bible in sight. Then he said, oh, it's in that shelf. It's gray in color. And we looked and we couldn't find it, a gray colored Bible. But eventually I saw a yellow Bible on the bottom shelf. I said, this is your Bible, right? He said, yeah. So he's, 
I said, which chapter do you want me to read? He said, doesn't matter. So I picked out one which I am very familiar with. It's found, it's so difficult to, to, to pronounce that word. Psalm? Yeah, 23. So the Lord is my shepherd. So I read it to him, and when I read that, that verse, those verses to him, he, he was so calm, so calm, and he closed his eyes. And then, and then after that, we had a little chit-chat, and then we meditated. When we meditated, he was calm, but the nurses and the janitor was, were very noisy outside. But anyway, it doesn't matter. We meditated for about 10 minutes or so, and then I said, let us do some metta. As soon as we, I said, let us practice metta. He opened up his eyes, he started talking, blah, 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 and he wanted this and he wanted that. Then I knew it's not, it's not the time for metta. But then the, um, that was the beginning. And today, ever when again. I think you should, you should, you should tell the story, I wasn't there. You can use my mic. Uh, uh, so today I went in. He recognized he recognized me. I think this time, uh, and he was saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, uh, you know the <laughs> the the." Two came yesterday, but you know, the, the very little one, the, the very, very little one, I said, you mean Sister Jessie? And he said, yeah, 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 S Sister Jessie was here. I said, yeah, that was both of us, we came last week. And, um, and I, I guess what I just wanted to say is how, how much I saw him turn, because he started off uh, going in a, quite a negative direction, because when then, when he wakes up in the morning and the nurses do their first rounds, the first thing they say to him is, oh, you're still you're, alive. yeah, you're still alive, you're still here. And it, re it really, of course, it makes him angry. And he said, yeah, see, what purpose can I have? And I said, no, Ken, w you have a purpose. Don't worry about what they think. Don't worry about w what they think your purpose is. What's your purpose? And, and then he, he said, yeah, you know, my purpose, I, I'm learning. I learned a lot. Mm. I know not to make the same mistakes. Yeah. I know how to be kinder to people. And he just started naming these things yeah. and remembering. He said, you know, think, yeah. we would go every week. I would go to the chapel. And, you know, he was, and, and he just went. And then he was just so grateful. Yeah. He was so grateful to all of us coming every week and spending the time with him. And grateful to, you know, I couldn't exactly tell who he was talking about. So sometimes he was talking about us as volunteers, and sometimes he would talk about other people. But just this sense of gratitude came up for him. And I was, I was really thinking about him during this, yeah. this session because he can't do anything anymore. He's just yeah. in the bed. But he can recount all those good things. Yeah. And, you know, he's got life in prison, so he's got a mountain of unwholesome but he can choose what he looks at right now and and that's why i was thinking about him is because he can direct his mind in that way which is so yeah. so important yeah. so thank you sifu so much <laughs> thank you thank you Yeah, I, I, I um, when you talk about him, I, I recall another inmate was um, also alive in prison, but uh, then released uh, and dying in, in, in the hospital. And uh, I was called upon to go and see him uh, by his friend. I went there and I, he was so uh, unconscious, but I, I, I held his hand and I said, um, but now he has passed and I can, I can mention his name. I said, John, this is Sister Jessie here. I said, whatever that you have done, 
uh, was in the past and you have seek forgiveness um, already and I'm sure your God is waiting to receive you and you will be happier there and so forgive yourself and seek forgiveness and go to see to see your God <laughs> that's what I said to him and then with a twitch of his eyes and I saw a drop of tears and then the, and his friend said wow sister his friend is also a very devoted Christian his sister thank you for coming and uh, I said oh there's very little thing that I have done you know um, but you know I, I just wish him to go in peace so I said just follow just follow your path and just go to see your God and uh, so so I left and I think by the time I get back to Pulam which was only 10 minutes later he already passed his friend told me I think I'm, I must be in the elevator he already he, he's gone so just like that let go so uh, yeah f seeing all these dying people or uh, inmates seeing their changes and we just have to keep reminding them especially when they're dying keep reminding them of the good deeds that they have done and of the good changes that, that are positive ch changes that they have succeeded and uh, I remember last week I said you still remember we you come to a meditation every Thursday and every other month that one day meditation course he said yes I still remember yes it was so nice it was blah blah blah, blah you know so so they needed that kind of support and and I mean they make mistakes who doesn't make mistake but they don't get that kind of support which is a shame which is a shame yeah but um, but I'm, I'm glad that um, now they allow us to go back in so we could go and see him more often yeah so I hope that he will get that palliative um, he had palliative interview today so uh, I hope that he will get and then we can go to see him in in the palliative care so yeah keep sending metta to him may these blessings extend to all that we with all the other living beings together will attain the Buddha way may we wish more and more people will encounter the wise words of the Buddha study them understand them practice them help themselves to liberate from all the sufferings and be ultimately happy and peaceful. <laughs>